Uh, we have Scott Heron, who's going to talk to us uh, about the Anishinaabeg revitalization of ethnomycology from Kuwait Ginequay's 1998 Popoe for the people to the present, that is, what has emerged from the ground. to the Tuscali uh, Cherokee people, uh, both of the Eastern Band and all of the bands. It's been an honor to be in their home territory. And so today I have a little different story. Um, some of us work with lots of different sets of organisms. And the one that I wanted to share a little bit today was uh, talking about fungi. Uh, and more importantly, how sometimes our academic scholars and peers sometimes have their perspectives. And those perspectives are based off of what they're actually given, you know, permission to learn. And they don't necessarily get the whole story. So as you see, my indigenous perspective for ethnobiology, I'm honored to uh, been asked to be a part of this. And so this initial revitalization of ethnomycology, to say it's um Kiwe Dinoque. And that means uh, woman of the northwest wind. So Kiwe in casinos and Susan Green would be the you know just the, the north north wind casino. Uh, and so her book, Popoe for the People, is what we're going to talk a little bit about today. It's a picture of uh, her in the you know, uh, upper corner there. So let's make sure I'm doing this right. Okay. Um, so this is just to let you know that you know I'm coming to this from my perspective. I'm coming to this from my academic perspective at Ferris State. Coming to it. Um, from my academic perspective at the University of Michigan. I've been honored to be teaching the Ethnobot uh, class there since Dick Ford um, retired for the last 11 years. And I have had, like some of us indigenous scholars, a hard time separating the personal life where you learn so many of these academic things from the academic. You know, it's just all part of that learning. Um, so, you know, and I, you know, I'm so honored to have, have both a young, young student, you know, kind of come in and share her things and have a scholars of, of both genders because that's what I, you know, I even try to do at Ferris, you know, bringing, bringing these next generation um, ahead. So, so, so I'd like to start um, with, with acknowledgement, something that I'm pleased to have learned from Nancy Turner and her students, you know, something that I just didn't want to wait till the end to acknowledge both about um, my university, Ferris State, University of Michigan and all the wonderful ethnobotany students and as well as uh, Chris Dickford who you know mentored and taught me so much and I've been working with several several organizations including the Cedar Tree Institute and the US Forest Service and Northern Michigan University and there's some really good resources here that's why I put those uh, websites up there and you can kind of check in with me later because they're doing some on the ground supply of you know, that's really powerful. Okay. So, um, make sure I'm good here. so We've seen in the literature this, this, this fungal phobia. Some of you may recognize these scholars up here, uh, but you know, back in the early days of, of ethnobotany in, in the Great Lakes, you know, Melvin Gilmore wrote this, some uses of Chippewa plants, as well as Sharon Smith wrote his ethnobotany of the Chippewa, ethnobotany of course, Potawatomi, and many others. And what I found when I was looking into those, as well as Francis Densmore's work, is they often would say things like what is said here, the Chippewa have evidently had disastrous experiences with the mushrooms in the past and do not use them as food. You know, children might um, gather a common bracket fungus, like the spomies and now known as Ganoderma aplanatum, um, but that's about it. And so that was just a picture in my office. And if you're not familiar with this fungus, Ganoderma aplanatum, it's a calm fungus, and I'll just send that around, one that I collected when looking for morels with my son. And what you'll see when you get to that is it's one of the oldest pallets in this part of the world because when it's fresh, as you put some kind of a stick on it, it will pull the dark spores up to the surface. 
and it'll make a permanent etched mark without any pin or any ink. But if it's dry, it doesn't do that. And I've noticed even the traditional loss of that knowledge, you know, kind of going to the point where people now would burn them though because they don't realize that they drew it on them right when they're fresh, they would have this archival thing. But if not, it won't work when it's dry. So that's an already dry one, so it's not going to scrape up very well. So, so yes, and so in this case, here on Smith, you know, kind of acknowledged that that there was a non use, but that's about where he left it. Um, but that's a pretty powerful statement, and one that I guess the point was was that it wasn't refuted from our scholars from the 20s and the 30s and 40s until what we get, you know, we get a little farther along, and you'll see where it gets refuted. So this is a little bit more um, to tell you about how the fungi have been portrayed in our biological literature, you know, where in this case you can see that the writer found none of the Ojibwa didn't eat any of those mushrooms. And they, I like the two names for them, and I'll tell you a little story. Now this piquage um, is one that you don't, I don't hear in, used in the culture and community anymore. Okay, but this Ojibwe is a modification of a word that we do use today, which is Wajash uh, Wedons. And this Wajash Wedons really is describing Wajash, this muskrat. But by saying Wajash we, we, it's kind of putting it into a verb form. It's the action of those muskrats. If you've ever seen muskrats, that, you know, they'll be around in the water, they'll pop up, and then they'll just disappear. And then they'll swim around, and they might pop up again. Well, and then don'ts is the diminutive, making it small. So Wajash Wedons was a way of saying, these fungi are like muskrats. They just all of a sudden just pop up and appear, and then they disappear. And so as a verb-based language, it was very powerful to see that that was one of the two major words that are still in use today for fungi. And so I don't forget about it. If you want to learn a little bit more about some of those terms when you leave, I've got about 20 copies of um, two handouts over in the corner that have some of this stuff on them. Um, so you, you probably read a little bit more about it. We often, so often hear about this, Trial and error is the only way things have been learned. That can be dangerous with fungi, right? And that was the assumptions of our colleagues, was that that's where it is now. I was cooking some uh, fungi and some bison there with uh, one of my crazy up about students. Um, and uh, we don't want it to lead to somebody being in one of those things that's on the, up on the left, which that's, that's what we call spirit house. That's a, the traditional way of burials in the Great Lakes. And it's all made out of the jakeesha, the white cedar. And it's something that's very different than the Christian headstone behind it. Um, but you know, when you eat, if you were all trial and error with plants or with fungi, and you have a small population, it's not really good odds for uh, the survival of your community. So how do we get beyond that? Well, what happens is that in this case, this woman, um, often known as to her, you know, um, close people as Grandma Key or Grandma. Way to no way. And so you can see that she passed in uh, you know, 1999. Dick Ford tried to get me to work with her before she passed, but she was getting ill when, when I was in graduate school. And I never had the good opportunity to spend personal time with her. The image down at the bottom is in one of the two editions of her book. It's pretty radical. It's pretty uh, deep when you start looking at it. And um, what she did was, this is what, this is what uh, Wikipedia has. So it's nice that Wiki is recognizing some indigenous scholars. So you can read that, you know, so. Um, and she has a, you know, last name of Rochelle that she, you could find out a little bit more about her because that's, you know, uh, part of her non-indigenous side. And I like how they describe her as a scholar, a lot of herbalist and medicine woman, and a teacher and author. There's people that would say a lot more about her. Um, I, I guess I would just say that, you know, she, uh, she was in some ways a controversial figure because she was a pretty powerful woman and she didn't necessarily do things the way that either other indigenous learners did things or the way that some of the academic folks expected to do. So to give you context, this woman was born 1919. This is, uh, you know, the, the islands up in Lake Michigan. So, so you, you've got, for some of you that know the context, um, the Mackinac Bridge is right there where the 75 is. It's the tip of the mid, as we say. So St. Marie, Canada, and Michigan up in the corner. Um, if you've been honored to be able to see any wildlife refuge, if you go past Grand Island, you'll get over to Marquette. It's this set of islands called the Beaver Island Archipelago, where she was uh, born. And specifically, 
if you zoom into the very historic and unique Beaver Island, uh, right up above that, you'll see that. See where it says Garden Island, um, just north of Beaver Island? That's the island that Key was born on. Okay, so very remote. And uh, it's part of the Little Traverse Bay Band tribal you know, area. But that allowed her to have some perspectives that Maine Matters didn't have. Uh, specifically, when she wrote this book in 1978, uh, it was one where she wrote things like this, you know, using foamies. Ignarius, Fomis momentarius, people would smoke out the bees. Um, you know, and, and to give you context of uh, what the Fomis are, uh, this is one of the one of the Fomis. It's a bracket fungus that you know grows on several things and can kind of pass that around. You can see that these days you might consider it in the broader polyporaceae. Um, there's been you know different reclassification where you kind of you know, split it off into its own. Family, but these uh, were used to anesthetize bees so you could get in there and get their honey. Not bad. People also used um, for that some of the puff balls. So these are some smaller puff balls, and you know, be careful if you take any of the puff balls out, you might, you know, might get a big nose full of, uh, <laughs> yes, of, of that. And like, like you'll hear maybe. Um, you know, from Linda, if you talk to her, one of our other speakers, is that both the Anishinaabek people and the uh, the Lakota people use puffballs as a you know to stop bleeding, and I think that's probably common throughout the world from what I've seen. Um, you know, down in, in in the yeah. So so that's um, something, but most people don't realize that you can use those to provide some more smoke and to help it for that heck of a lot of bees because people didn't have bee suits in the old days. Okay. Um, and so this is, these are some quotes from, from her book that you can take a look at. And so people needed that. that. But if you, um, if you burn these things, they burn slow. And if you could, you could reuse these um, conch fungi, as we often call them. So that was written about in, uh, in her book in 1978. And, she, you know, she went out to talk about a couple of these other ones. Some of these um, fungi have changed. The nomenclature from 1978 till now. So if you're looking at these and saying I'm confused about you know what I'm seeing, it's just because you know my hands are talking about that later. But if any of you are familiar with this beautiful fungi I'll show you next, the dahlia, um, they didn't like to use that, even though it would work for smoking out the bees. They didn't like to use it because they had another purpose, one I had never heard of before. Uh, Keith. And uh, so I'll show you I'll show you a little bit about that, but. What I wanted to do to give you a perspective of a fungus that we um, still use today, some of you might know this fungus, um, I'll pass around a dried piece of it, Anotinus obliquus. Um, we call it Nojibwa skataga. Um, in, in Russia, they call it chaga. And um, to a lot of people's surprise, in addition to many of its properties, it's used for starting fires, transferring fires, and even today used as a smudge. And so I made sure that the, um, made sure that the building knew that, let's see, I should almost use friction fire like you'll see in a minute. Um, cheap matches just <laughs> suck. Um, I've got a lighter in the bag. But, but if any of you, you if you, any of you have used uh, the, these fungi, didn't expect that my matchbox was this late. Of course, who's our smokers around? Anybody have a? We got one. We got so one. I don't have to. So I don't have to dig into my bag for it. What I wanted to do is just, um, just kind of. You got to be careful with this, so you won't want to pick this up. I wanted to give you the chance to smell what one of these fungi smell like, and it, all it's going to take is just that tiniest amount of uh, doing it to, to catch, and then. You know, it can be powerful for some people, uh, so I didn't want to kind of use a lot of it. But this is used as a smudge, not just as something for the bees. And you, once you catch a friction fire spark, you can keep it going for, for a real long time. And most people don't realize, and you can kind of pass that around, that, the, that fungi can be used as smudges, just like plants, like the prairie sage that I have over here. So, 
there's a lot of uses of this amazing fungus that comes from the birch trees. And I recorded a little bit in my dissertation. It was still used, you know, the turn of the um, century, that is, you know, the 2000th century. Uh, but chaga, or shkatagan as we call it, um, has a lot of uses. Now, one of them that I will um, kind of point out here is that I've gotten my University of Michigan ethnobotany students to start investigating these fungi and plants a little bit deeper. This was what we, what we call, uh, after Dick Ward's naming, a species productivity schedule. And we would have the kids research during this four week ethnobotany course, one fungus for a uh, planet, where they would look at all the cultural and ecological, scientific and non-scientific things that went into using one of these fungi or plants. And I've been pleased to kind of gather, um, you know, this is one that my TA and I had to put some edits on, students work looking at these things, discovering and diving deep into them. So I have a couple copies of uh, this one that you could uh, take a look at. So in the class in Ethnobotany for University of Michigan, we started showing them how to make fire bundles, how to use this fungus to do hand drills and other kinds of friction fire, but to use this fungus in the process, that traditional knowledge of how to do this uh, properly. So whether it was puff balls like this that you were, the giant puff ball that you were, you know, gathering and using, or whether you were kind of doing what I like to do with this, cut it up when it's, you know, in the younger, fresher white side and put it into some kind of a pasta dish. Um, I just decided we need to start getting the young folks involved in doing the ethnobotany and ethnomycology, so we started using them. So going back to Key for a minute, they would, you hear about people carrying fire, they typically didn't carry a flame. They typically carried an ember of one of these fungi. And sometimes, you know, taking a cloth like what you have there, having that little bad coal going of the fungus and having that capped on top, so then they may be wrapped up in leather, but they have probably some air to them, and they could travel from place to place, not with a flame that would go out, but with an ember that they could go back and start the next fire when they went from village to village. So as peoples of the three fires of Anishinaabe, that's one of the things um, that, that we would do. So just a little bit more about you know, those fungi being used that way. This is the, this, this Adelia that they didn't like to use for smudging, for starting fires, and for getting these out, because it's so beautiful. So if you don't know the oak cone, this is what it looks like on a tree, on an oak. And uh, the Adelia is a gorgeous you know, maze there. And so what you have is a fungus that really was prized because with women, especially the Shinobic women with long hair, they needed something to brush that hair. And this was a prized thing for grooming. So that is the reason why they did not use it for that. So it's just kind of go ahead, you know, you can kind of take a look at some of the old historic ways that they would harvest and uh, process it, even uh, bartering with our Dakota, you know, colleagues uh, who had horses later on. And so, so fungi were used in a lot of different ways, including if you had a really important pipe ceremony that was significant, a treaty sign, you didn't want that pipe to go out. So a little bit, a little bit of that scatography, not this oblivious, either ground up or in that in that pipe block or pipe bowl would ensure even if you had to go around hundred people smoking, it would stay with us. So if you don't know this one, just briefly, Chick in the Woods, a wonderful, wonderful fungus. And uh, he was talking about it being used back then. Um, this is what it would look like if you were about to use it for, for food. Yum. Look for it. She, she even had a nice story about a mushroom pot. Uh, so, Trichloma, as well as this Pleurobus. And this Pleurobus that I'll show you in a minute is something that we really started reusing in this class. So some of you will recognize Dick Ward up in the corner, and that's when we co-taught the class in 2003, and since then, you know, he had retired and kind of went on. But in that ethnobotany class, really what I wanted to kind of wrap up with is showing you that we really started doing things like teaching the kids to use those oyster mushrooms and those wild leeks and those morel mushrooms, and to really start getting to use these foods and not be afraid of them. And it kind of went from those students doing things like a morel pasta, right? It was a black morel morcello, uh, to the oyster mushrooms, looking at them in their habit and when they're being used, to a delicious dish like this wild rice cranberry um, oyster mushroom 
So we do this with the students because we want to really get them to the point of not being afraid of these things. So really, to kind of wrap, that, wrap this up, I've moved from working with just the students at the university to working with our tribal communities are finally asking for relearning these things. This is a workshop up um, in the UP that I'll just show you with the map where it's at. And the kids, the adults, are really excited. So we were up at the tip of the q and Bay for that workshop. And we just really need to think about not being so afraid of these things and allowing these fungi to just be a part of this other big biota thing. So, you know, it's just a story today, not a, not a nice, you know, big research-based thing, but just encouraging you to kind of push your envelope and to find where maybe you could uh, be part of a revitalization movement. At some point, you might eventually get to the point where you become the one who they're asking to come and teach and carry these things out. So that's my son from years ago collecting a morale, and I hope that some of you will get out and do these kinds of things with fun shot. That I said, do it. Thank you.